Thank you. So the first talk of the refractive session is going to be a little, little bit about screening for refractive surgery. Now, it's given the title Deciphering Corneal Tomography. And I am a consultant to o Oculus. I just want to let you know I receive no payments, royalties, et cetera, for any of the displays, software, or sales of the Pentacam. Now, I often get sent multiple maps from multiple machines, from multiple physicians to assist in their reading. And I get sent from the same patient maps from the Pentacam, the OrbScan, Placido Topography, Corvus, et cetera. And more often than not, the more maps you look at, the more confused you will be. So let's look at a couple examples here. How many of you would say this patient is acceptable for LASIK? It's a very normal anterior and posterior curvature map. And those are the, on the lower left, those are all the standard, really the topography indices, but they're available in other machines, and they're all very, very normal. We'll get back to this patient later. Now, how about this map? Again, the curvature maps, anterior and posterior, look completely normal, and on the indices, we have one mildly abnormal IHD. But again, how many of you would consider this an appropriate candidate? How about this? How many of you would do LASIK on this patient? Could I sh just show our hands if any of you would do LASIK on this patient? So I'm, I'm the only one. Someone else. A few other people. So let's go back to that first example I showed you. The picture on, on the left, normal curvature. Every single topographic indice is normal. But look at the display on the right. What you will see is a fairly abnormal map a posterior ectasia, an abnormal pachymetric progression, but again, the anterior indices are all completely normal. The second patient, while we did have an, a one IHD that was abnormal, if you look again on the right, and I'll explain this map a little bit later better, but I think most of you are familiar with the bad display, a very highly abnormal display, over four standard deviations outside the norm, but again, the changes are on the posterior surface and an abnormal pachymetric progression in spite of the fact that the anterior indices are fairly normal and the curvature maps look normal. Now let's go back to this patient. It's really not a patient, actually. I don't look at inferior steepening and I don't look at IS values. I use one machine, and I know this is a horrible thing to say at the institution that has more machines than anyone in the world, but I look at, I have one machine, and I basically, in 99% of the time, look at one map. I do not look at curvature. Why? Well, to understand tomography, we need to understand how elevation and curvature differ. And while all the examples I'm going to show you are at the Pentacam, they are not machine-specific, and they really apply to any tomographic device whether it's Scheim, Flug, or OCT. Now, curvature is analogous to measuring a spectacle lens power. If I gave all of you a lens and had you look at it in a lensometer, you would all come up with the same answer. It's very, very accurate. But it actually tells you absolutely nothing about the shape of the lens. We all know that multiple different shapes can give us the same power. So you can see here on the bottom, we have multiple different shapes, but in a lensometer, you would get the exact same reading. So power does not imply shape. And I will show you that curvature does not imply shape. But more importantly than the fact that multiple shapes can have the same power, the same shape can have multiple powers. And all of us in the audience who have an astigmatic pair of glasses know that if we tilt the glasses, we actually change the power of, of the lens. So we showed you that multiple shapes can have the same power, but the same shape, depending on orientation, can have different powers. Now, we kind of knew that way back hundreds of years ago when we were just using a handheld placido disc. We knew that it was very important to hold that disc and try to get a perpendicular surface. 
And when we move from the 1700s to the 1950s, this is a corneoscope. I'm guessing no one in the audience has one. It was actually predates when I was born. But the person who derived this knew that and made it a very long tube. Very long tube so that basically to keep it perpendicular and properly or, or, or oriented. We kind of lost that a little bit when we went from that long tube corneoscope to a, a computerized video keratoscope. Now let's go back to the example about that inferior steepening where I was one of the few people who would do surgery on that patient. This is an astigmatic test object. And I know Damien er earlier talked about the wonders of Gullstrand. Well, he did a great job, but the problem is we apply his Gullstrand-reduced eyes to clinical examples where they shouldn't. And the picture on the left would be something that follows Gullstrand's reduced eye, and effectively a, a zero-angle kappa. The one in the middle is five degrees. The one on the right is outside the normal range, but it's 12 degrees of tilt. And if you look at the display, the maps all look relatively similar. And if you go over the old literature on topography, not tomography, but topography, they all used either spherical test objects, which were absolutely useless because they're meaningless, or astigmatic test objects. And what they showed here is orientation didn't really have a whole lot. The maps look very much the same. The problem is, is that look what happens when we use an aspheric astigmatic test object. And we all know the human eye is not is an aspheric surface. When we do an aspheric astigmatic test object, look, look what happens. The eye that follows Gullstrand's reduced eye, zero degree <laughs> angle kappa, looks like a symmetric bow tie. But look what happens as we induce some tilt. We get inferior steepening that most of you would consider a stigmata of keratoconus. This is not keratoconus. It may be, but you can't look at a curvature map and determine shape. Just like I told you, we take a, a spectacle lens and we tilt it. We don't alter its shape, we alter its power. Here, we don't alter its shape. It's not a cone, but we alter the curvature map. This is another example. The map on the left follows Gullstrand's reduced eye, zero degree angle kappa, but this is why we get that inferior steepening on the right. You'll notice, and this is going to blow it up too much, but you'll notice here that when we do axial curvature, and actually the same as if we do tangential curvature, we get a short radius of curvature or a steeper area on a curvature map, though the shape is identical. So whether we tilt the disc, like a placido disc, or we tilt the eye, which is angle kappa, the effect is the same. We get what we view as a change in shape, but it's not. It's a change in curvature, and again, curvature does not depict shape. And this is an example here. The angle between the pupillary axis and visual ax axis is angle kappa, and displacement up to five degrees is physiologic and normal. And a normal angle kappa is enough to give us an abnormal curvature map. So this is why I look at elevation, and really rarely for screening. I want to stress, we're talking about screening for refractive surgery. I rarely look at curvature maps. So how do we look at ele elevation? Again, the most common way is to compare it against the reference surface, and the most common reference surface is a best-fit sphere. Here you can see in blue the flat meridian is above the best-fit sphere, the steep meridian is below, and we get the typical astigmatic patterns that we see on the right. So you can see on the left here we have a normal astigmatic pattern. Now very often I'll get maps sent to me and someone will say, well, I have a plus 26, is this abnormal? If your pattern is normal, don't worry about what the number is. The numbers just tell you the magnitude of the cylinder and how far you are from the apex. So the pattern on the left is a normal astigmatic pattern. Again, the magnitude of the elevation differences is related to how far you are from the apex and the amount of astigmatism. The picture on the right, though unusual since it's such a pure cone, is what we look for when we're screening patients for ectatic disease. We call that a positive island of elevation. And while I explain the derivation of the astigmatic pattern, why do we get this positive island of elevation on an ectatic cornea? Well, if we look at a cone, and again, compare the cone to a best-fit sphere, you'll notice that the best-fit sphere truncates the cone at the top, corresponds to the plus area, the positive island of elevation, and below the zero point, that thin band of green, 
we actually get minus, which is blue. And where do we get the biggest negative? It's not in the far periphery, but in the mid periphery. And I wish I had a regular pointer rather than this, but that's the deepest area right, right there. So that's the derivation of that positive ion of elevation. And that's what we look for when we're screening patients. Now, why do we use a best fits view? You'll, have, you'll hear some other people talk about other shapes. We have a very well-known person who talks about a toric ellipsoid. Well, the best fit sphere is the easiest to interpret and gives us the most intuitive. So these are four maps. The upper left is a best fit sphere. The right is, is an ellipsoid. The lower left is a toric ellipsoid. And the right is a best fit toric ellipsoid. And what you see, and these are cases of cones, is that the positive island is always easiest to see on the best fit sphere, upper left. Same thing here, upper left. But is the best fit sphere really the best shape? Well, what is the best shape to try and screen for ectatic disease? Well, this is what a best fit sphere does on a schematic ectatic cornea. What we really would like, we would like something that would further accentuate the cone. We want something to make visual inspection easy. Rather than using the best fit sphere, if we were able to get a shape that more closely mimics the more normal periphery, it would further accentuate the cone. And what we did with the bad display is we developed something called an enhanced reference surface. And what we did is we took the standard best fit sphere, which is computed from the 8 millimeter zone, and we subtracted, it's actually a fluid number between a 3 and 4 millimeter optical zone, at the thinnest point of the cornea. And what that does is it actually removes the bulk of the ectatic region from the best fit sphere. And it takes what's the upper left and converts it to the up, upper right. And again, it allows the ectatic region to be basically be more positive or more visually in something you can inspect. Normal corneas actually undergo very little change, which you can see on the lower portion. And again, you can see here, if you look at the left, there's, and again, I wish I had a, just a normal pointer, but a very subtle hint here. But notice what happens on the right when we use that enhanced reference surface. That positive island becomes very easy to see. And when we looked at a whole series of cones versus normal eyes, the actual difference going from the enhanced reference surface from the standard reference surface was highly statistically significant to separating normal from abnormal. And if we look at the anterior surface, cones actually underwent about a 20 micron change, normalized less than two. And on the posterior surface, cones underwent a 40 micron change and normalized less than three. And that's really easy to see graphically here. So it turns out that not only was that enhanced reference surface easier to allow us to make a visual inspection, but the change going from a standard best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface was highly statistically significant to basically screening patients. And that really is the derivation of the left part of the Bell and Ambrosia display or the bad, bad display. The right part is mostly PAC, PACometric data. The upper right is just a standard PAC map. And the lower right are basically PACometric progression graphs. And the bad display actually looks at nine different parameters in a regression analysis to help us screen patients. I want to stress, this is screening patients. It's not diagnosing disease per se. Each parameter, and there are nine parameters in the regression analysis, are actually reported in standard deviations. And it will turn yellow if it's 1.6 standard deviations, and it will turn red at 2.6 standard deviations. But the only parameter that really has statistically significance in screening patients is the final, it's called the final D. Again, each parameter is reported individually, but the only one that has statistical significance is the final D. And the best way to explain that is if someone comes into your office with a pressure of 22, that's outside the normal range. But if I had a cup to disc of 0.1, no family history, normal nerve fiber layer, um, and a normal visual field, they're normal. They just have one parameter that's slightly above. So don't overread the individual parameters. The final D is the one that's statistically significant. And again, this is what the display looks like. And you can see even the, even the parameters that aren't listed below are color-coded when they fall outside that normal range. 
So as I said, you may have individual yellow or red, but again, and have a final normal reading. You have to use other information, including age, the ablation depth, family history. And I'm going to skip over this quickly, but in general, I do use age as a, as a prognostic indicator, and I'm more cautious in younger patients. So this has been kind of the age brackets that I've used for a number of years. And you can see here, as you get older, I allow a, fi fi a f higher final D number. Now, many of you have read articles on the TBI. This is work done by Renato Ambrosia. And the TBI is a combination of biomechanical parameters and tomographic parameters. I tested this, and I don't want to bad, but I still think there's some limitations and problems with the computation. But one thing about the TBI is that it has age as a factor. So I actually worked with Renato, and I said, OK, I still think you have some problems with some of the other parameters, but let's keep everything constant and just vary age. And we did that over a number of different final Ds. And what you will see on this graph is that age is a linear factor. And then I said, OK, so on his TBI, this is the graph of age. In other words, less risk the older you get. Let's superimpose that now on what I do clinically. And that's my graph clinically. So my clinical data and his analytical data based on his regression analysis were basically exactly the same. And what it turns out is that age factor is a 0.05 change in D per year. So in general, I adjust my final D based on if you're less than 30, I add 0.05 per year up till age 18. We don't really have data younger than 18. If you're over the age of 32, I subtract 0.05. So hopefully at some point, and uh, Oculus is very slow to update our maps, hopefully we'll actually come out with uh, the next iteration, which will have an age-adjusted final D. So again, the BAD allows for a high specificity and sensitivity. However, nothing is by itself. You have to use clinical judgment. I don't feel additional testing with Placido is necessary. But again, age, ablation depth, family history, stability is very important. And remember also to compare both eyes for symmetry. I use glaucoma because it's a great example. But if someone comes into your office with pressures of 12 in both eyes, probably not alarming, 19 in both eyes, not really alarming, 12 in one, 19 in the other, that's a red flag. So with that in mind, let's look at this map. Okay. Anyone have problems with this map? So the upper is the corneal thickness map, the lower is back ele ele elevation. Each individual map looks completely normal. Here is another one. But what you will notice, while each individual map is normal, the picture on the right has a 30 micron difference in corneal thickness. The picture on the right has a 50 micron difference between the two eyes. Many years ago, we published some data on what normal range is for asymmetry. And while we don't know what this really means, it's the same as when the patient walks in with the 12 and 19 IOPs. It's a red flag. And basically, for thinnest point, if it's above 25 micron dif difference, there are two standard deviations outside the norm. And if it's above 33, there are three standard deviations outside the norm. When I get sent maps, sometimes I'll get sent maps from one eye only, and I will refuse to read it for, for the referring physician. You need to always look at both eyes, always look at symmetry, and again, use your best clinical judgment. No single map should tell you what to do. So again, the symmetry values are here. And as I said, high asymmetry, regardless of whether both eyes are normal, should be viewed as, with, as a red flag and you should proceed with caution. Thank you.